we are on our journey of finding the common ground between the pro-Trinitarians and anti-Trinitarians. So far we made it to the part 4 of the series where we will discuss the quotation, a famous quotation of Ellen White, the heavenly trio. The purpose of this series is to remove the antagonism between these two opposing groups and provide data on which both sides of people can agree with. So mainly we are focusing on the writings of Ellen White because both sides respect the spirit of prophecy and for this reason writings of Ellen White are the best place to find a common ground. The question is often raised why do brethren on the both sides of the controversy are so much in conflict while both they accept the authority of the spirit of prophecy. When we look at the both sides of the arguments, often it seems like as if Ellen White is contradicting herself, but that is far from the truth. The problem is, as we have seen in the part one of the series, is that Ellen White, she dealt with the Trinity on completely another dimension. So instead of discussing the Trinity, someone Trinitarian or not, she was uplifting the truth on the personality of God and where his presence is. She was also pointing us back to the history of our movement, to the experiences of how God has given us the truth. She was pointing us to the official beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at that time. Now, why was Ellen White so much giving focus on the truth, on the personality of God and where his presence is? In part three, we have seen that this doctrine is putting in harmony those seemingly contradicting statements which are used by Trinitarians and anti-Trinitarians. The harmony of her statements would not be accomplished if the doctrine on the presence and the personality of God is not discussed. In part two, we have looked at what exactly the doctrine on the personality of God thought. Now, the burdening question is, how does the doctrine on the personality of God and God's presence fit in all those quotations from Ellen White about the heavenly trio. Unfortunately, the anti-Trinitarians do not talk much about these quotations. Ellen White called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in different names. She called them the three living persons of the heavenly trio. She called them the three dignitaries or three highest powers, three distinct agencies, um, three great powers, among many other names. All of those quotations are, are Sister White's reference to Matthew 28, 19. And this is valuable text, and many Trinitarians are founding their belief on these verses. The question is, how can Breton find a common ground in these quotations? And by common ground, I do not mean merely nominally acknowledging their belief in the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, but common ground in the sentiment. We have already discussed that people discuss words rather than sentiments. And for this reason, when the sentiment is not discussed, the writings of Ellen White seem contradicting. For this reason, I want to take time to discuss the sentiments of the heavenly trio quotation, which unfortunately anti-Trinitarian brethren are not so vocal about. And I believe if we can find a point of agreement on the heavenly trio, they will be less antagonism toward each other. I want to share with you some data which is, I believe, very interesting for us today when we have this controversy in our church. James White was the editor of Review and Herald publication. Mostly James White and Uriah Smith were alternating as editors of these publications and at the end of the year usually they have recommended and resold some spiritual books which were also from non-Adventist authors. I want to show you one book in particular which James White had recommended in 1871 which was a Trinitarian book. In Review of Herald, December 1980-71, we read the recommendation. It says, the following list of books we offer for sale for the special benefit of those who wish to purchase holiday gifts for their friends. We offer none but what on examination have been found to be the best of this class of books and comparatively free from popular theological errors. We offer them at publisher's price postpaid. And then you can find the book 
the higher Christian life. In 1876, again, in recommendation, we find this book, and this is Higher Christian Life. The interesting part about this book is that this book was a Trinitarian book. The author was non-Adventist, but the Trinitarian sentiments of this book is very close to our modern Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the Trinity. I want to read the portions of this book which are explaining the Trinity doctrine and also want to show you our position on the Trinity which will clarify more what we teach in regard to God today. So keep in mind that the Seventh day Adventist Church in 1871 was non Trinitarian. In 1872, we published the first official declaration of Seventh day Adventist belief, and by that declaration, we know for certainly that Seventh-day Adventists uh, from that time did not adhere to the Trinity Doctrine. Today we talked about the progressiveness of truth, how we move from non-Trinitarian movement into a Trinitarian church, and interestingly, here we have a book in recommendations of James White and Uriah Smith, who were clearly non-Trinitarians, recommending a Trinitarian book that is very close to our teaching of the Trinity Doctrine today. I find this significant discovery, and I want to give to this book in regards to the Trinity teaching a little bit of attention. I believe in examining the document we can find a common ground between non-Trinitarians and pro-Trinitarians. <laughs> The book Higher Christian Life was written by an evangelical pastor by the name William Boydman. This book received a lot of attention and instigated the movement by the name Higher Life. The book was written in 1858 and it was very popular in the United Kingdom, Europe and United States. And of course this book was read by Adventist pioneers and also we find it in Adventist private and office library from Ellen White. The main topic of the book was sanctification, which shared the hope that the man can achieve this higher Christian life. As William Borden was Trinitarian, he also shared in this book his Trinitarian view of God. His view is very interesting because today we uphold very similar sentiments in regard to the Trinity doctrine. So we read it from page 99, and which was entitled The Holy Trinity. And then again, the Father is the author and planner of salvation through faith in His Son. And when we trust in His Son, we honor the Father, because we accept of His plan of salvation for us, justify His wisdom and act in accordance with His will in the matter. A glance at the official and essential relations of the persons of the Holy Trinity to each other and to us may throw additional light upon our pathway. Upon this subject, flippancy would border upon blasphemy. It is holy ground. He who ventures upon it may well thread with unshod foot and uncovered head bowed low. So William Boardman talks about the plan of salvation when the official and essential relationship of the persons of the Holy Trinity is shown. So he makes the preparation for his argument. Speculations here too is entirely out of place, unsafe, no worth the ink used in the writings. The lamp of human reason is a light too dim to guide us through the profound mysteries of the mode of divine existence and the method of divine manifestation and working. God alone knows what God is, and God only can communicate to men what man can be made to know of God, especially of the personalities of the Godhead and their relations to each and to us. Revelation must be our guide. Beyond what God has revealed, we know nothing. The sacred word is all the light we have in this matter. In a sense, scriptural and true Christ is all the fullness of Godhead bodily, the express image of the invisible God, the fullness of him who filleth all in all, the fullness of the Father and of the Spirit. In a sense, equally scriptural and true, the Father is all the fullness of the Godhead and also is the Spirit. Now he states his main argument, which throw additional light upon our pathway, when we take a glance of the official and the essential relations of the persons of the Holy Trinity, as he says, 
to each other and to us. Then he states, The Father is the fullness of Godhead, invisible, without form, whom no creature had seen or can see. The Son is the fullness of Godhead embodied, that his creature may see him and know him and trust him. The Spirit is the fullness of Godhead in all the active workings, whether of creation, providence, revelation, or salvation by which God manifests himself to and through the universe. Remember, this is a glance at the official and essential relations of the persons of the Holy Trinity. So how did he came to this conclusion? He said, the revelation must be our guide and the sacred word is all the light we have in this matter. And then he quotes the Bible, Christ is all the fullness of Godhead bodily. He is the express image of the invisible God and Christ is all the fullness of him who filleth all in all. Now he goes the step further and show us where else in the Bible we can recognize the official and essential relations of the persons of the Holy Trinity. So where else can we recognize that the Father is all the fullness of Godhead invisible and the Son is all the fullness of Godhead manifested and that the Spirit is all the fullness of Godhead making manifest? This was the main argument of William Boardman. So William Boardman points us to the scripture. The counsels of eternity are therefore all hidden in the Father, all manifested by the Son, and wrought by the Spirit. Let us glance first at the official relations of the persons of the Godhead. He talks about the Trinity. To gain something like a distinct idea of this divine relations, we need to be lifted up in the thought, as the eyes of the patriarch Jacob were at a battle, by a letter which its foot's on the earth but its top in heaven. Such a letter the Bible sets up before us in the names and similes of the persons and work, especially of the Son and the Spirit. The Son is called the Word, the Logos. Now a word before it has taken an articulate form is a thought. The word is the express image of the thought, the fullness of the thought made manifest. So the Son is the fullness of the God had manifest. The thought is the fullness of the word not yet made manifest. So the Father is the fullness of the Godhead invisible. Again, the Spirit is like the thought expressed and gone forth to do its work of enlightening, convicting, and changing. When thought has been formed into words, risen to the tongue, fallen from the lips unto the ears, into other hearts, it works there its own full work. So the Holy Spirit is the fullness of Godhead at work fulfilling the design of God. And then he says, the Father is like the thought unexpressed. The Son is like the thought expressed in words. The Spirit is like the word working in other minds. I hope you get his point about how he is giving some evidence about the official relations between three persons of the Trinity. He uses representations or illustrations to illustrate the official and essential relations of the persons of the Trinity. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead invisible, the Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested, and the Spirit is all the fullness of Godhead making manifest. He continues with more of such representations. Another of names of Jesus will give the same analogy in light not less striking, the Son of Righteousness. All the light of the Son in the heaven was once hidden in the invisibility of primary darkness. And after this, the light now blazing of the orb of the day was, when first the commandment went forth, let be light. The light was, at most only, diffused haze of the gray dawn of the morn and creation out of the darkness of chaotic night without form or body or center or radiance or glory. But when separated from the darkness and center in the sun, then in, in its glorious glitter it becomes so resplendent that none but eagle eye could bear to look it in the face. But then, again, its ray falling aslant through Earth's atmosphere and vapors, gladdens all the world with the same light, dispels the winter and the cold and the darkness, starting spring forth in floral beauty, and summer in vernal luxurious and antum laden with golden treason for the garden. The Father is as the light invisible. The Son is as the light embodied. The Spirit is as the light shed down. I hope you see the point. He uses the illustration of the Son of Righteousness to show that God the Father, 
who is all the fullness of Godhead invisible, is like a light that was hidden in the prime of darkness. And then Son, who is all the fullness of the Godhead embodied, is like the light that is embodied in morn of creation. And the Holy Spirit, who is the fullness of Godhead in all active working, is like a light shed down. Then again, he uses more representations from the Bible to further prove his main point. One of the similes of the blessed influence of the Spirit while giving the self-same official relations of the persons of the Godhead to each other and to us may illustrate them still further. The dew. The dew of Hermon. The dew on the mow meadow. Before the dew gathers at all its drops, it hangs over all the landscape in invisible vapor, omnipresent but unseen. By and by as the night wanes into morning, and as the temperature sinks and touches the dew point, the invisible becomes the visible, the embodied. And as the sun rises, it stands in diamond drops trembling and glittering in the sun's young beam in the pearly beauty upon leaf and flower over all the face of nature but now again a breeze springs up the branch of heaven is wafted gently along shaking leaf and flower and in a moment the pearly drops are invisible again but where now fallen at the root of herb and flower to impart new life freshness vigor to all it touches the Father is like the dew in visible vapor. The Son is like the dew gathered in the beauteous form. The Spirit is like the dew fallen to the seed of life. And you get the point. Let's continue read it. Yet one more of these Bible likenings, by no means exhausting them all, will not be unwelcome or useless. The rain. Rain like the dew floats in invisibility, in omnipresence at the first, over all around all. Seen by none. While it remains in invisibility, the earth parches. Clods cleave together, the ground cracks open, the sun pours down his burning heat, the wind lifts up the dust in the circle whirlwind, and rolling clouds, and famine gaunt, and greedily stalked through the land, followed by pestilence and dew, death. By and by, the eager watcher sees the little hand-like cloud raising far out over the sea. It gathers, gathers, gathers comes and spreads as it comes in majesty over the whole heaven. But all is parched and dry and dead yet upon earth. But now comes a drop, and a drop after drop, quicker, faster, the shower, the rain, sweeping on and giving the earth all the treasures of the clouds. Clouds open, fur softens, springs, rivulets, rivers, swells the fill, and all the land is gladdened again, with restored abundance. The Father is like to the invisible vapor, the Son is as the leaden cloud and falling rain. The Spirit is the rain fallen and working in refreshing power. William Boardman uses some illustrations from the nature and he wants to be very careful when comparing God with the things his hands have made. In order not to be misunderstood, he clarifies his sentiments. He says, These likenings are all imperfect. They rather hide and illustrate the three personality of the one God. For they are not persons but things, poor and earthly at the best, to represent the living personalities of the living God. So much they may do, however, as to illustrate the official relations of each and to other, and of each and all to us. And more, they may also illustrate the truth that all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of triune God. And now he makes again conclusion. The Father is all the fullness of Godhead invisible. The Son is all the fullness of Godhead manifested. The Spirit is all the fullness of Godhead making manifest. The persons are not mere offices or modes of revelation, but living persons of the living God. A glance at the official and essential relations of the persons of the Holy Trinity through these imperfect likenings are illustrating the official relations of the three persons of the Trinity. So they illustrate the truth that 
all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of triune God. Basically, he speaks about how God is one, yet three. The given sentiment isn't far away from our present-day teaching of the Trinity Doctrine. Of course, a present-day teaching is more sophisticated, but it's very similar in its essence. So let me show you from Seventh-day Adventist Belief. This is a book. Uh, this is 27, but we have today 28. There, are, there is this biblical exposition of fundamental doctrines of our church. In chapter 2, which is an explanation, the second belief or Seventh-day Adventist belief, which is dealing with the Trinity, we read about relationship within God, with the Godhead. And this was the subject we have read in the High Christian Life. There are three subsections. One is loving Father, and uh, then it's the working relationship, and then comes another subsection which says the focus on salvation. And in it we read, and I'm going to read it on the computer, it says the following. The relationship within the Godhead. The first advent of Christ gives us as much clearer insight into the triune God. John's Gospel reveals that the Godhead consists of God the Father, see chapter 3 of this book, God the Son, chapter 4, and God the Holy Spirit, which is chapter 5. A unity of three co-eternal persons having a unique and mysterious relationship. And then... He says, there is no distance between the persons of three and God. All three are divine, yet they share their divine powers and qualities. In human organizations, final authority rests in one person, a president, king, or prime minister. In a Godhead, final authority resists in all three members. While the Godhead is not one in person, God is one in purpose, mind, and character. This oneness does not obliterate the distinct personalities of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, nor does the separateness of personalities within the deity destroys the monotheistic thrust of Scripture that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. And he says, within Godhead, an economy of function exists. And now listen to this. This is what working relationship he explains and that's what we have read god does not unnecessarily duplicate work order is the first law of heaven and god works in orderly way this orderliness issues from and preserves the union within the godhead the father seems to act as source the son as mediator and spirit as an actualizer or applier this is Spirit is making manifest. So this is very similar what William Boardman has claimed. William Boardman has claimed that the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. That's the same sentiments we believe today. In theological circles, there is something that is called immanent view of the Trinity, as well as economic view of the Trinity. So when we are talking about working relationship, um, this is a reference to economic view of the Trinity. The imminent view of the Trinity represents three persons of the Godhead who are truly God. So the imminent view emphasizes the equality of each person as God, each having all the divine attributes of God, like being omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. These three persons were affirmed as who God really is in his true self. And this is expressed in our official beliefs as one God the unity of three persons. On the other hand, the economic view of the Trinity gives us focus on the functions of each person as relates to salvation. In this view, we see the headship of the Father and the subordination of the Son to the Father and the Spirit to the Father and the Son. This um, subordinated roles are considered as economy of functions or duties but they are not a part of the imminent view. So, the economic view of the Trinity is not considered a part of who God really is because three persons are three equal persons together making one God. 
So these designated roles serve purpose only for us to better understand salvation, and they only have the appearance of roles that God puts upon himself or upon his three selves in order to accomplish the work. This is the reason why, in explanation, the economy of functions, they say that the Father seems to act as a source. In reality, not only God the Father is the source, but all three equally. From the standpoint of the economy of functions, the Father seems to us in that way because he acts out this role. And the Son seems to be mediator between God and man, but in imminent view of the Trinity, all three are God in equal way. If you're more interested in this difference and relationship of imminent and economic view of the Trinity, I recommend the textbook from Systematic Theology, God as Trinity by Norman R. Gulley. I hope this clarifies the position we as church have today. So William Boardman was talking about the economic function of the roles in the Trinity. But also in the footnotes, he expressed his imminent view of the Trinity. For the sake of time, we are not going to read it, but you can read it yourself. Link to this book is in the description below. William Boardman uses certain illustrations not only to give us, as he says, a glance to official and essential relations of the persons of the Holy Trinity, but he also illustrated the truth that all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of the Chiyun God. He uses certain illustrations to show us that God is one, yet three. And he says, upon this subject, flippancy would border upon blasphemy. It is holy ground. He says, he who ventures upon it may well thread with unshed foot and uncover head bound low. And in conclusions, he says, These likenings are all imperfect. They rather hide and illustrate the three personality of the one God, for they are not persons, but things, poor and earthly at the best, to represent the living personalities of the living God. The illustrations are used to represent three living personalities of one living God. This is a mystery to us, and many people are trying to grasp their heads around this concept of Trinity, and often such illustrations come handy to fulfill this purpose. For instance, this is an example of explanation of the Trinity written by a dog bachelor on Amazing Facts. He says, the signs tell us that light is constituted of three primary rays or groups of wavelength. Clearly distinct from each other, none of them without the other could be light. Each ray has its own separate function. The first originates, the second illuminates, and the third consummates. The first ray, often called invisible light, is neither seen nor felt. The second is both seen and felt, and the third is not seen, but it is felt as heat. Like light, our one God is revealed in the three distinct persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Please do not go over Doc Batchelor claiming that he said that God is light. No, he just used the light as an illustration to describe this concept of one God, yet revealed in these three distinct persons. Later, in section God manifested in nature, he uses more examples. Though there is nothing in this world that adequately illustrates God, Paul declares the invisible things of him from the creation of the world can help us understand his eternal power in Godhead. The truth that God is a tree unity of two invisible persons, Father and Spirit, and one visible person, Jesus, is evident even in creation. The universe is composed of three structures, space, matter, and time. Of these three, only matter is visible. Space requires length, height, and width to constitute space. Each dimension is separated and distinct in itself, yet the three form space. If you remove height, you no longer have space. 
Time is also a three unity of past, present, and future. Two are invisible, past and future, and one is visible, present. Each is separate and distinct, as well as the essential for time to exist. Man is also a tree unity, having physical, mental, and spiritual components. Again, two are invisible, mental and spiritual, and one visible, it's a physical. Cells compose the fundamental structure units of all living organism. All organic life is made up from cells that consist of three primary parts, the outer wall, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus, like the shell, white, and yolk of an egg. If any one is removed, the cell dies. In each of these examples, the removal of any one component results in demise of the whole. In like manner, the Godhead contains three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each is God, yet there is one God. The removal of one person destroys the unity of the whole. The given sentiment is very close, if not the same, with the sentiments we have read in the higher Christian life. The sentiments is the same, but different illustrations are used to convey the same point. God is one, yet three. Amazing Facts is self-supporting ministry and is not official body representing Seventh Adventist Church, but the same sentiments we find in official sources from our church. For instance, several years ago, on our official website, we had a video with one such example explaining the Trinity. I will play this video now for you. The idea of the Trinity is one that most Christians believe in. In fact, it came about the third or fourth century. In fact, the word Trinity comes from the, from the Latin word Trinitas. And the idea is that you have God, but then God has three other attributes. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One of the best ways that I like to explain what the Trinity is, is through the example of an egg. I don't know about you, but I love eating eggs. And I want to, I want to assure you that none of these eggs were ever harmed during this production. Okay? I have this egg in my hand. And when you take a look at the egg, it's an egg. But if you were to crack open an egg, there's a couple elements that you're going to find. One is that there is an egg yolk. There's what you call the egg white. And then there's a shell. There's three different parts to an egg, but yet it's still an egg. And that's kind of the same idea with the idea of who God is. Um, even though there is just one God, there are three attributes of God. God the Father, the guy who lives up in heaven. God the Son, um, Jesus Christ, who came here on this earth to help people understand who God really is. And then you have God the Holy Spirit. Um, in fact, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit right before he leaves from, from the earth and goes to heaven. And he says, don't worry, don't be worried, I'm going to send you the Comforter, also called the Holy Spirit. There's three parts to God, but there's still just one God. Before someone starts accusing the church that we believe that our God is an egg, please be fair because this is not what this brother has said. He used the illustrations of an egg just to illustrate the concept that God is one, yet three at the same time. There are other examples how we use to describe this concept that God is one, yet three. In the new pictorial aid for Bible study, we have illustrations like this. So, the tree in God, the sun, is the light, heat, and power, time, past, present, future, space, light, breath, height, uh, solid, liquid, gas is the matter. So, the Father, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost, they are, each one, one of them are God, but they are not one and another. They are distinct persons. The reasons why I'm showing you this is because our modern teaching of the Trinity is very close to what we have read in the high Christian life. So here is another example by Ivor Myers in his um, presentation called The Sonic Warfare. Music is actually a reflection of the very nature of God. What do I mean? How many parts to music? There are three parts. Melody, rhythm, Harmony, okay? How many in the Godhead? Three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Please listen to what I'm about to share. 
The word melody comes from the Greek or Latin melos. It means tune. For those who are opposing the Trinity teaching, please do not misrepresent Pastor Ivor Myers. He, he's not saying that God is music. He just says that he used three elements of music to illustrate one in three nature of God. God is a person, just as William Boardman explained. He said these likenings are all imperfect. They rather hide than illustrate the three personality of one God. For they are not persons, but things, poor and earthly at the best, to represent the living personalities of the living God. So much they may do, however, as to illustrate the official relations of each to other and of each all of us, and more, they may illustrate the truth that all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of triune God. So what he is doing, he's just showing what we all know about. Let's wrap up the data. In 1871, James White, who was clearly non-Trinitarian, recommended to the public a Trinitarian book, The High Christian Life, which was written by evangelical pastor William Boardman. The very sentiments of the Trinity in this book are not much different from our present-day teaching on the Trinity doctrine. It is interesting discovery concerning the development of our Trinity doctrine. Now, what is even more interesting is Ellen White's comment on the book Higher Christian Life. Her comment is in her famous quotation that three living persons of the heavenly tree. We just read the segment of the higher Christian life, which was dealing with the Trinity doctrine. Interestingly, Ellen White quoted William Boardman. Do you want to know Sister White's take on the William Boardman's Trinitarian sentiments? She said the following, I am instructed to say, the sentiments of those who are searching for advanced scientific ideas are not to be trusted. Such representations as following are made. And now she quotes William Boardman. The Father is as the light invisible. The Son is as the light embodied. The Spirit as the light shred abroad. The Father is like the dew invisible vapor. The Son is like the dew gathered in virtuous form. The spirit is like the dew fallen to the seed of life. We know that this is now William Boardman. Another representation, the father is like the invisible vapor. The sun is like the leaden cloud. The spirit is rain fallen, working in refreshing power. Did you catch that? Sister White quoted William Boardman. Not only that, but her comment is in instruction from heaven regarding the sentiments promoted in the book Higher Christian Life. By William Boardman. The instruction was that the sentiments of those who are searching for advanced scientific ideas are not to be trusted. And she made specific reference which sentiments she is referring to. She was referring to the sentiments that which illustrates the three personality of one God or are illustrating the living personalities of the living God. Or they illustrate the truth that all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of triune God. That sentiment is a Trinitarian sentiment, expressing the idea that God is one, yet three. And many people read this quotation without knowing what Sister White was referring to. And they conclude that the sentiments she's referring to are pantheistic sentiments. But they are not. William Boardman made very clear what his sentiments are. They are Trinitarian sentiments. The startling point is that this instruction from heaven is heaven's comment in regard to the Trinitarian sentiments we widely believe and advocate today. And this, is, this instruction is a pivotal in our controversy regarding the Trinity today. The contextual rendering of the instruction from heaven is that the sentiments of those who are searching for, ad for Trinitarian ideas are not to be trusted. Let's ask ourselves a proper question, why? And does Ellen White give us a further explanation? And certainly she does. 
Ellen White goes into details fixing the wrong sentiments expressed by the William Boardman. So let's study her response very carefully and let's compare her writings with William Boardman side by side. So we read William Boardman and Ellen White just follows his line of reasoning and he, she fixes the issues that are in William Boardman's sentiments. She says all these spiritualistic representations, mark this, spiritualistic, are simply nothingness. They are imperfect, untrue, they weaken and diminish the majesty which no earthly likeness can be compared to. God cannot be compared with the things his hands have made. These are mere earthly things suffering under the curse of God because of the sins of men. The Father cannot be described by the things of the earth. So mark carefully the similarities and differences. Sister White agrees with William Boardman that his representations are simply nothingness and that imperfect. But certainly William Boardman would not say that these representations are spiritualistic and untrue. Because he's using those interpretations to say that they are illustrating the three personalities of one God, that they also may illustrate the truth that all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of true and God. So pay close attention who is God for William Boardman. For William Boardman, God is triune God or Trinity, the three persons of one God. But mark who is God for Sister White. So those illustrations for William Boardman illustrates the three personality of one God, although weak and, and are imperfect, but she says that those spiritualistic representations, that by them God cannot be compared with the things his hands have made, who is she referring to? The Father cannot be described by the things of the earth. For Sister White... God is God the Father. God the Father cannot be compared with the things made by earth. For William Boardman, God is triune God or Trinity. So the illustrations that serve to illustrate the official relations of the three persons of the Trinity, and they illustrate the truth that all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of the triune God, that truth that William Boardman is talking about Sister White is calling that spiritualistic and the representations to show that truth are spiritualistic representations. In following, Sister White addressed the main argument of William Borman and she corrects his erroneous sentiments. So the father, according to William Borman, is fullness of the Godhead, invisible without form, who no creature hath seen or can see. So the Father is all the fullness of Godhead invisible. And mark the difference what Sister White says. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The thing we are currently reading is the most poignant testimony to the doctrine of the personality of God. So what stronger expression do we need to convey that the Father has a body than to say that he is all the fullness of Godhead bodily? And no, Sister White is not making a mistake here. She was instructed from God to say these things. This is light from heaven. God has a body. He is all the fullness of Godhead bodily. Although he has a body, he cannot be seen by mortal sight. Jesus said to Sister White, if you once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Here we see the same behavior of Sister White when she dealt with the Trinity Doctrine. Just as in letter 253 from 903, she exalted the doctrine on the personality of God in the face of the Trinity. The same thing she's doing here. And take a closer look how she corrects William Borman's sentiments and exalts the truth on the personality of God. She says the Son is all the fullness of God had manifested. The Word of God declares him to be the express image of his person. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here is shown the personality of the Father. Sister White agrees with William Borman that the Son is all the fullness of God had manifested. But they came from two totally different positions. 
for Boardman, the Son is all the fullness of God had manifested because he is the manifestation as an office of the person of the Godhead. For since the white, the Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested because the Son is express image of his person. Pay close attention. Since the white talks about ontology, she talks about the personality of God. She uses the Hebrew one three. That is about the personality of God. The personality of God deals with the ontological side of the questions in regard to God. So, William Boardman is approaching Christ as the fullness of God had manifested from a um, functional or economic side, while Sister White approached from ontological side. If maybe you don't see it at the moment, and maybe you're confused at what I've just said, we will discuss the details in our next study. But when she quoted John 3.16 and Hebrews 1.3, she was referencing to the personality of God. In these verses is shown personality of the Father. Concerning the spirits, Sister White wrote, the comfort that Christ promised to send after he ascended in heaven is the spirit in all the fullness of Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and, and believe in Christ as a personal savior. So every detail has its proper place. Do you know why the Holy Spirit is in all the fullness of the Godhead and is not personally all the fullness of, of the Godhead. It is because the Holy Spirit is a spirit. It does not have a body as the Father and the Son do. The Spirit dwells in body. If Sister White believed in Trinitarian co-equal personality, she would just endorse William Boardman's sentiments. But instead of endorsement, she is rejecting, condemning, and fixing. And now comes the shocking part. So please spot the difference. Again, William Borman talks about the Father, Son, the Spirit. These persons are not mere offices or modes of revelation, but living persons of living God. And Sister White says, There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subject of heaven in their efforts to live a new life in Christ. The sentiments of the Father, Son, and the Spirit for William Boardman is a very different sentiment regarding the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by Ellen White. So, William Boardman talks about the three persons, that there are three persons of one God, or three personality of one God. And he speaks, the persons are not mere offices or modes of revelation, but living persons, and this is plural, of the living God, singular. For Ellen White, there are three living persons, but not of one God, but of the heavenly trio. And this is crucial difference. These two are not the same because the former are expression represented the sentiment which is not to be trusted, and that's the Trinitarian sentiment, while the latter expression from Ellen White is in harmony with the doctrine of the personality of God. The heavenly trio doesn't mean one God, but it means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And just as Matthew 28, 19 clearly says, the Matthew 28, 19 does not assert that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. We need to ask ourselves the main question, and we need to ask ourselves in honestly. Is one God really three? According to data that reveal the sentiments of illustration Sister White quoted, we see that she objected to that sentiment. But in our current Seventh-day Adventist belief, we have this sentiment. So what biblical exposition do we take to prove our belief that one God is a unity of three persons? So let's have a look at this book. Because this is a biblical explanation, exp exposition of fundamental doctrines. 
And this book is published by Ministerial Association General Conference of Seventh day Adventists. Again, we are going to look into chapter 2, which gives a biblical exposition of the second point of fundamental beliefs, which claims that one God is unity of three persons. There is also a section that deals with these sentiments, and it's called the oneness of God. So in this section, we're going to find a biblical exposition that one God is supposed to be unity of three persons. So let's read it. The oneness of God. In contrast to the heathen of surrounding nations, Israel believed that there is only one God. And now four verses are quoted. The New Testament makes the same emphasis of the unity of God. And here comes five quotations. This monotheistic emphasis does not contradict the Christian concepts of triune God or Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rather, it affirms that there is no pantheon of various deities. What we just read is a biblical exposition which claims that one God is a unity. In order to support this claim, four verses in the Old Testament are used and five verses from the New Testament. But do those verses really talk about one God being a unity or unity of three persons? So let's have a look at these references in the New Testament, which, as it says, make the same emphasis of the unity of God. So the first one is Mark 12, 29 to 32. In Mark 12, Jesus is asked by one of the scribes, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered, quoting Deuteronomy 6 and 4. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus did not hint that one God is a unity of three persons. In fact, Jesus claimed that God whom Jews worshipped was his Father. He said that if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye, speaking to Jews, says that it is your God. One God of the Jews is God the Father. And this is in accordance with all other verses we read in the Bible, which are talking about one God. Yet the very same verses are used to support, supposedly show that one God is a unity of three persons. Next one is John 17:3. In John 73, Jesus is praying to his Father, and he says, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So Jesus called his Father the only true God. The word only is exclusive to multiple others. Jesus said a very clear teaching that one God is the Father. So how come is this an evidence to use to prove the unity of God? Again, the next verse they, they show is 1 Corinthians 8, 4-6. And there Paul said, But to us there is but one God, the Father, clearly, of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Again, the verse doesn't say that one God is a unity, neither the unity of three persons. But rather the one God, one God is the Father. Again, this verse is very exclusive to the idea that one God is multiple. Paul says, we know that the idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. That one God is not multiple, it's not a unity, but it is the Father. So how can GC use this word to show that God is a unity of three persons is beyond a clear language of the Bible. And the next verse is Ephesians 4, 4-6. In Ephesians 4, Paul speaks about one God as the Father. He says, There is one body and one spirit, even as are called, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and then he says, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So here the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned, but only the Father, by the text we read, is referenced as one God. The verse doesn't give any hint whatsoever that one God is actually a unity of three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it is very clear that one God is the Father. So, what kind of biblical exposition is this? The fifth quotation, I mean the fifth reference is 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is one God, and it says a unity of three persons, and one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. So is that what the verse, that the verse is saying? No, there is one God, and one mediator between God and man. One God is the Father. Every single instance of God, of the verses that speak of a one God, are revealing in a clear language of the Bible that this is the Father. So the question is, from where did we get this idea that one God is a unity of three persons? Certainly we did not get it from the Bible, because all instances in the Bible speaks of the Father. So where did we get this from? Did we get it from Ellen White? Maybe. That one God is three. So let's do a quick research of Ellen White writings, because there must be some language from Ellen White that claims that one God is a three persons. So let's put these phrases that would convey this sentiment. So in the quotation marks we can write there, one in three, and do a search. Results are zero. Or three in one. Results are zero. Three is one. Or one is three. Or one or three. I mean, this is kind of bad grammar. Or three are one. So far, nothing. And even this three are one, the result is nothing. Isn't this strange? And by the way, the phrase three are one is a phrase which is found in the Bible. It is in 1 John 5 7. This text is in particular is used by Trinitarians to prove sentiments that one God is three. But this text doesn't say that three are one God. It says that these three bear witness and these three are one. One in what? In the context you see they are one in testimony and witness. They do not make one God, neither is the Bible contradicting herself. But interestingly, Ellen White never used 1 John 5, 7. How come? <laughs> It is claimed repeatedly that Ellen White was a Trinitarian. One of the main arguments to prove this claim are her references to Matthew 28, 19. And one of the most prominent quotations used for this purpose is this quotation we, we are studying. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. But never, and I really mean never, not, not that I found researching Adventist scholars, theologians and historians, I never saw anyone bringing the context of the heavenly trio quotation, unpacking the sentiments quoted by Ellen White through the book Ellen White quoted. If the context of the higher Christian life is unpacked, then we can clearly see that Ellen White was against the sentiments of the three living persons of one God. And yet, all Adventist scholars and historians use this quote to prove the very thing she objected to. So what is the difference between the statement that there are three living persons of one God and three living persons of the heavenly trio? The trio is a group of three, 
And Sister White is referencing Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said to his disciples and also to us, He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Jesus did not teach here that the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost make one God. The word God is not even mentioned. So, Jesus mentioned a group of three. And Sister White calls this group of three the Heavenly Trio. She also calls it three dignitaries or three distinct agencies, the three great powers, and so on. Those are her references to Matthew 28, 19. So, is Matthew 28, 19 the only verse in the Bible which talks about these great dignitaries? No, there are other verses which mention the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And they are the ones that explain each other. So, in Ephesians 4, 4 4-6, as we have read, we we see that there is one body and one spirit. That's the spirit mentioned. Even one, as we are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord. That's the reference to Christ. One faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all. So, all three, this is a heavenly trio, here is mentioned. But only the Father is called one God. So, here is another verse. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Alright? And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. That's Christ. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So, the word God is meant to who? To all three? No, it's meant to the Father. Again, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost. Who is God called here? This is Christ. This is Holy Spirit. This love of God is the Father. So, God is not referencing the three. That All the verses that speak of three of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're not saying that they're one God. Ephesians 2.18 For through Him, the context is the Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Also, people would say, hey, this is economic trinity and so on, but there is no imminent view of the trinity because, again, as we see everywhere else, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when I mentioned, the Father is the God. But we are bound to give thanks away to God for you, bread and beloved of the Lord. That's Christ, because God had, from the beginning, chosen you salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Again, how much more shall the blood of Christ, that's the Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, again, offered himself without spot to God. To whom? That's the Father. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So again, we are looking into these verses. They're all three are mentioned, just as Matthew 28, 19. But assertion is made that this Matthew 28, 19 speaks about God, which is unity of three persons. No. They all, if the Bible explains itself, then it has to be that God is referencing the Father as all the other verses are doing. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So all three are mentioned. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. All three mentioned, only the Father is mentioned as God. All of these verses are talking about heavenly trio. That means the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The same reasoning holds ground for Ellen White's interpretation of Matthew 28, 19. We quote, The Christ has given his followers a positive promise that after his ascension he would send them his Spirit. Go ye therefore, he said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and a personal God and of a Son, a personal prize and savior, and of the Holy Ghost sent from heaven to represent Christ, teaching them to observe and so on. So she's quoting Matthew 28, 19, and next to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, in, in brackets, she puts their explanation. The Father is a personal God. So there is no way that 
Matthew 28 that she uses in such a way to convey there is one God, especially when we know what she said for William Boardman's sentiments, that they are spiritualistic. So the Father is a personal God, according to Ellen White, the Son is a personal Prince and Savior, and Holy Ghost is sent from heaven to represent Christ. Another quote from her is that let them be thankful to God for his manifold mercies and be kind to one another. They have one God and one Savior and one Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is to bring unity into their ranks. There are many anti-Trinitarians who refute Ellen White's writings on Matthew 28 and 19, and ultimately they reject them. Some of them go so far to claim that all of her writings were compromised because in the original Bible, Matthew 28 and 19 is modified. They claim that the original words of Christ were that we go and baptize them in the name of Christ and that the Catholic Church has modified the original word to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in order to prove the Trinity doctrine. And in order to prove this, they quote Catholic sources. And several years ago, um, on social media, there came a post claiming that Matthew 28 is modified, and there is a lot of references in that post to that aim. This post is very popular among anti-Trinitarians, and it has been recycled many times. However, when you check out the sources they claim, you will find out that those sources are either misquoted, or some of them don't even exist. So those claims have been debunked by other non-Trinitarians. At some point I will make a video on this because this supposed evidence that Matthew 28, 19 is modified underpins the authority of Ellen White because she uses this verse many times. For instance, we know that 1 John 5, 7 is inserted text into manuscript and Ellen White never used that verse. But this is not the case with Matthew 28, 19. Sister White is a prophet of God, and she shed light in regard to Matthew 28, 19. And I would rather recommend people to investigate this light in her writings, and you will find out that this verse is completely biblical. But this light has nothing to do with who God is, and let alone the Trinity. So, I will leave that light on Matthew 28, 19 for some other occasion. Once we get to know the context of the heavenly tree quotation, we can clearly see that Ellen White wasn't Trinitarian. She objected to the basic premise of the Trinity doctrine, that is, the three living persons of one God. Unfortunately, our scholars and historians never examined the real sentiments Ellen White was referring to when quoting higher Christian life. When Ellen White says that the sentiments of those who are searching for advanced scientific ideas are not to be trusted, and then she says such representations as the following are made, the assumption is always made that Ellen White was quoting sentiments of Dr. Kellogg in connection to pantheism. But actually, she was quoting Trinitarian sentiments of William Boardman. Sentiments of William Boardman are very close to our present-day understanding of the Trinity doctrine, if not the same. But certainly, there is agreement between William Boardman and our present Trinitarian teaching. And that is that the doctrine of Triune God, that there is three persons of one God. Today, we frame the same sentiments that one God is a unity of three persons. If you wanted to know what's the take of Sister White on our present Trinitarian theology, now you have the evidence. The behavior of Sister White is always the same. In reaction to Trinitarian sentiments, Sister White uplifted the truth on the personality of God. This is what happened here. She used the clearest language to convey that God has a body. She says, the Father is all the fullness of Godhead bodily. And this is the core teaching of the personality of God, which is the personality of the Father. Also note that in this instance of response to the Trinity, Sister White pointed us back to the right platform of our faith, 
which was established at the beginning of our movement. We read this in a few paragraphs after she quoted William Boardman's Trinitarian sentiments. She said, I write this because any moment my life may be ended. Unless there is a breaking away from the influence that Satan has prepared and a reviving of the testimonies that God has given, souls will perish in delusions. They will accept fallacy after fallacy and will thus keep up a disunion that will always exist until those who have been deceived take their stand on the right platform. These words of the prophet were never more true than today. So what is the influence of Satan she is referring to here? In the context, we know that she is pointing us to the doctrine or sentiments of three living persons of one God. And she is pointing them as a delusion. Also, she is giving us a remedy how we can escape this delusion, which was prepared by the influence of Satan. It is by reviving the testimony that God has given. So she is writing this in 1906 when we have held the fundamental principles which God has given us in the beginning of our movement. And now she says they, and by they um, she's talking about those who are deceived by the Satan, they will accept fallacy after fallacy and will thus keep a disunion that will always exist until those who have been deceived take their stand on the right platform. There will be disunion between those who are deceived under the Satan's influence and those who are standing on the right platform. And this is really important for us to understand once we are dealing with the common ground. Do we want unity in our church? So here is how we can have it. We need to meet on the right platform. Soon we will have a dedicated study to examine this platform, um, what Sister White is pointing us, because she wrote a lot about that. But you will see that this platform is not a Trinitarian platform. There should be no ambiguity about that. Sister White was pointing us back to the fundamental principles, and we have a clear, clear revelation of what the fundamental principles taught, especially on the doctrine on the personality of God. Also, we know that all pioneers who stood on that platform and defended this platform did not accept the Trinity doctrine, and the main reason why they rejected it was the doctrine on the personality of God. And Sister White is acting the same way as our early pioneers, and she uplifted, uplifted the doctrine on the personality of God in the face of the Trinity, and she pointed us back to the right platform. And this platform is not based on complicated premises and reasonings of our scholars, but rather it is based on the simplicity of the truth as it is in Jesus. So let's continue reading because Sister White is giving an insight to the future or rather the insight to our present day. All this higher education that is being planned will be extinguished for it is spurious. The more simple the education of our workers, the less connection they will have with the man whom God is not leading, the more will be accomplished. Work will be done in the simplicity of the true godliness, and the old, all times will be back, when under the Holy Spirit's guidance, thousands were converted in a day. When the truth in its simplicity is lived in every place, then God will work through his angels as he worked on the day of the Pentecost. And hearts will be changed so decidedly that there will be a manifestation of the influence of genuine truth as is represented in the descent of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never has and never will in the future divorce the medical missionary work from the gospel ministry. They cannot be divorced. Bound up with Jesus Christ, the ministry of the word and the healing of the sick are one. The 58th chapter of Isaiah contains instruction for us today. Cry out loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show thy people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sin. God does not accept Dr. Kellogg as his laborer, unless he will now break with Satan. The work would not have been hindered, as it has been for the past several years, if Dr. Kellogg were a converted man. Come, I call, come ye out and be separate from him and his associates whom he has leavened. 
I am now giving the message God has given me, to give to all who claim to believe the truth. Come ye out from among them and be separate, else their sin in justifying wrongs and framing deceits will continue to be their ruins of the soul. We cannot afford to be on the wrong side. We cannot afford to cover the truth with scientific problems. We urge the decided change be made and no more stumbling blocks be placed before the feet of the people of God. Let every soul be put on the gospel shoes. Let every soul pray and work, placing their feet upon the foundation Christ laid in giving his life for the life of the world. What a message if you put it in the context of the Trinitarian sentiments. The context of the heavenly tree quotation was, as we saw, in the context of Dr. Kellogg's controversy. But in this case, it was addressed Trinitarian sentiments promoted by Dr. Kellogg and his associates by using William Borman's book, The High Christian Life. We know this only in the context which is always ignored. In the reading of the context, we read, I am instructed to say, and that is the message from God. And God says, the sentiments of those who are searching for Trinitarian ideas are not to be trusted. Without addressing the true sentiments from the author Sister White quoted, there is a no real understanding of what Sister White was addressing here. Do you know how many papers from scholars have been written and how many books have been written on the heavenly tree of quotation? As the proof that Ellen White supported the Trinity. All of them. But all of them are void of the real context of this quotation. By misrepresenting the context, they're misrepresenting the sentiment and they portray Ellen White to be on the side which, which she fought against. Most of the research done by our scholars admits that Ellen White addressed Kellogg in the heavenly tree quotation. And here scholars are overreaching themselves. There is a great effort to depict Kellogg crisis as a pantheistic crisis, but here is the evidence Dr. Kellogg promoted Trinitarian sentiments. Why is Ellen White addressing Trinitarian sentiments in response to Dr. Kellogg if Trinity wasn't the issue with the Kellogg's controversy? In the book, um, The Trinity by Widden, Moon and Anne Reeve, they argue that Ellen White is a Trinitarian, but also that Kellogg was Trinitarian, but that he advocated a false Trinity. So let us read this. In contrast to the view that she unsparingly denounced, she set forth another concept that is regarded as the right platform. This is what we read. In harmony with the simplicity of true godliness and the old, old times when under the Holy Spirit guidance, thousands were converted in a day. That's what we read. The antagonism between two opposing perspectives could scarcely be drawn in more stringent terms in a theological context than a disagreement between doctrines of seducting spirits and the doctrines of the old, old times of the original Pentecost. What she's talking about is two constructing teaching about the Trinity. Here is the first, attributed explicitly to Dr. Kellogg and his associates in our leading medical fraternity. And then he goes and he quotes everything what we have read from I'm instructed to say the sentiments and so on. And now in conclusion, they say, in charging that Kellogg with his spiritualistic Trinity doctrine was departing from the faith that Adventists had held sacred for the past 50 years. Like he's presenting as this Adventist held the Trinitarian doctrine. And that's not the true. That's historically not true. She clearly refutes the assumption that all doctrines of the Trinity are the same and that the pioneer's objection to one of them demands the rejection of all. She saw at least two variants of Trinitarianism, one that portrayed a personal tangible God and the other that spiritualized him as impersonal, listen to this, impersonal, philosophical, but ultimately unreal. The crucial mistake and error in reasoning of Widden, Moon, and Reeve is that they did not include the entire context of what Sister White quoted, and they did not unpack the sentiment of William Boardman. 
<laughs> they see and they cannot deny that Dr. Kellogg was Trinitarian. And they see Ellen White objecting to him. And in order to make Ellen White Trinitarian, they make a claim that Ellen White is objecting to a different type of Trinity. And in particular, they claim that Ellen White is objecting to the Trinity, which is impersonal, philosophical, and untrue. And that doesn't really make sense when you really, when you read the actual Trinitarian sentiments of William Boardman that Sister White objected to. These likenings are all imperfect. They rather hide and illustrate the three personality. So there's some impersonal God here. No, it's not. Three personality of one God. For they are not persons. I mean, those illustration. But things, poor and earthly at the best, to represent the living personalities of the living God. So this is supposed to be, you know, impersonal trinity. So much they may do, however, as to illustrate the official relations of each and to other and to each and all of us, and more, they may also illustrate the truth that all the fullness of him who filleth all in all dwells in each person of the tree and God. Sister White objected to the very sentiment that one God is made of three persons, or th three living persons of one God. In the light of the context, I mean, their reasoning doesn't make any much sense. Widden, Moon, and Reeve, in a few pages earlier, quote Dr. Kellogg how Kellogg has advocated that Holy Spirit is a third person of the Godhead. The question is, how can Kellogg advocate the impersonal trinity while advocating that Holy Spirit is a person, the third person of the Godhead? The data doesn't add up to the given conclusions. Those wrong conclusions are the results of something called reactive theology. They need to create the other side of the aisle to say that the reaction of that will prove that Sister White is a Trinitarian. And that is very, very, very bad reasoning. The Trinity doctrine is often proved by disproving the modalism and disproving the three theism, but ironically in the same time adhering to both, depending when and how you need certain elements. The problem is when these people use the same reactory approach to prove that Ellen White was a Trinitarian. Negating darkness will not bring light. Ellen White, she was a prophet of God, and her job was to convey the light from God in whom is no darkness at all. Therefore, the approach of Ellen White to the truth was always proactive rather than reactive. So was the approach of our Lord. If the Trinity Doctrine was the light from God, then she would certainly speak about it. If it was not, then we would expect from the prophet of God to never mention it. The same is true concerning Jesus and his teaching. The work of the prophet of God is to convey light. And in the behavior of Sister White, we observe the same pattern. Whenever she faced with the Trinity Doctrine, she was uplifting the doctrine on the personality of God. And that was the light. Knowing this principle, it is actually very easy to find Ellen White's remarks, which are potentially dealing with the Trinity Doctrine. All we have to look at is the light. And that's her remarks on the personality of God. So let us read several examples. The personality of the Father and the Son, also the unity that exists between them, are represented in the 17th chapter of John in the prayer of Christ to his disciples. The given quotation is in the Ministry of Healing. Ellen White wrote it in the time of Dr. Kellogg crisis to mitigate erroneous ideas promoted by leading men in medical work. The issue with the Kellogg crisis was his idea on the personality of God. And that is the most precise answer and explanation of the Kellogg's crisis. The personality of the Father and the Son, also the unity that be exists between them, are represented in the 17th chapter of John. The 17th chapter of John has nothing to do with God in nature. Here, Sister White is not throwing the darkness out of the window with a shovel, but actually she's turning on the light. But given light has nothing to do with the sentiments of God in nature or pantheism. But what is she actually referring here to? She says, study the 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 chapter of John. 
The words of these chapters explain themselves. And listen to what she says. This is life eternal, Christ declared, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ from whom thou hast sent. In these words, the personality of God and of his Son are clearly spoken of. So, wow, the personality of God she talks about, she talks about the Father being the only true God. The personality of the one does not do away with the necessity of the personality of other. This letter is Ellen White's letter to Dr. Kellogg. Does John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 have anything to do with God in nature? And what does John 17, 3 in particular have to do with God in nature? Nothing. But it has to do with erroneous sentiments of who God is and the unity between God and his Son. So could it be possible that Kellogg's crisis raised the theological side of questions of the doctrine of Trinity? So here are some more quotations like that. Jesus says to Jews, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. The Son can do nothing of himself. So this is all again in in the context of the Kellogg. What is this has to do anything with God in nature? About Christ can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father to do. For what things soever he does, these also does the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doth. Here again is brought to view what? The personality of the Father and the Son, showing the unity that exists between them. All right, this has nothing to do with pantheism in any way. This unity is expressed also in the 17th chapter of John, again, in the prayer of Christ for his disciples. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in them, that who? They, that's the disciples, also may be one in us, that's the unity that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou hast given me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, and that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, that hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Wonderful statement, the unity that exists between Christ and his disciples. Do not destroy the personality of either. They are one in purpose, in mind, in character, but not in person. It is thus that God and Christ are one. The relation between the Father and the Son and the personality of both are made plain in this scripture also. The relation between the Father and the Son and the personality of both are made plain in the scripture. The unity between the Father and the Son does not make one personal God. He's not one in person. And the unity which she referenced was not the unity which makes the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit as one God. The unity between the Father and the Son is the same unity. We are to be united with Christ. As Christ is in the Father and Father is in Christ, so we too should be in Christ and Christ in us. How? Here's how John plainly puts this for us. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. So that's dwelling in him and God dwelling in us. And hereby we know that he abideth in us. How? By the Spirit which has had given us. Another for chapter 4 in 1 John. It says, Hereby know that we dwell in him, and he is in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. The Father and Son are one, and this unity is in the Spirit. In the same way, we are to be one with the Father and the Son, and one with one another, by the Spirit which He has given us. This is the unity which Bible speaks of, and this unity does not make one God. Why are these topics discussed in Dr. Kellogg's Crisis? Could it be that Kellogg's book, The Living Temple, raise the theological side of the questions of the Trinity doctrine. So let's read the confession from the man himself. 
1907, Dr. Kellogg, in his interview, was recalling his excommunication from the church and retrospectively he commented on the sentiments he had put in the living temple. He said, speaking of the living temple, all I wanted to explain in living temple was that this work that is going on in the man here is not going on by itself like a clock wound up, but is the power of God that the spirit of God is carrying it on. Now, I thought I had cut out entirely the theological side of the question of the Trinity and all those sort of things. I didn't mean to put it in at all, and I took pains to state that in the preface that I did not. I never dreamed of such a thing as any theological questions being brought into it. Brought into what? The living temple. And what kind of theological questions? The theological questions of the Trinity. So he admits himself that he had put Trinitarian sentiments in the living temple. I only wanted to show that the heart does not beat of its own motion, but it is the power of God that keeps it going. Yes, Kellogg crisis raised the theological side of questions of the Trinity, because that was the sentiment Kellogg had put in the living temple. He did not mention the Trinity by name, but erroneous sentiments of the personality of God, which were a byproduct of the Trinity doctrine, were present in the living temple. Those sentiments raise the theological side of the questions of the Trinity. We see those questions raised when Ellen White was uplifting the doctrine of the personality of God. In this series, we are going over the doctrine of the personality of God, and we see through the Kellogg crisis the very same arguments and argumentations that are going on between those days, back in those days, and what we have today. But the things are a little bit shifted from different perspective, and people fail to see it because they are not looking through the light, and that is the, the truth on the presence and the personality of God. And that's something we need to put emphasis to. The problem with living temple, as the heavenly messenger have said, he said, I've been instructed by the heavenly messenger that some of the reasoning in the book living temple is unsound and that this reasoning would lead astray the minds of those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation principles of present truth. It introduced that which is not the speculation in regard to the personality of God and where his presence is. And this is the main, main objection. Doesn't matter. Was the reasoning, the reasoning of the Trinity doctrine, or it was the pantheism, or it was the sectarianism, or whatever ism. It doesn't matter. All of that is darkness. And the reason that we are not going to be deceived was because we we need to look back into what the foundation principles of present truth are especially concerning the personality of God and where his presence is as long we are looking into the truth we are not going to be deceived we are searching for the common ground and this in particular now becomes a very difficult. Keep in mind we are Seventh-day Adventists and what we are looking here, we are looking what Adventists have believed in the history. We are looking as the common ground as what Sister White have advocated. And we came to conclusion, I mean to the evidence, where Sister White is just stepping off, I mean refusing to acknowledge the the idea or sentiment that one God is a unity of three persons or that three living persons makes one God. When we look into chart, I mean, how the current Trinitarian controversy goes, there are pro-Trinitarian side and anti-Trinitarian side. And whenever the Trinity doctrine was in question, Sister White, just look at it through a different perspective. And that was the personality of God. That was the doctrine of the personality of God and where his presence is. And also she was pointing us back how we have received those truth. In this dimension about, you know, is somebody Trinitarian or not Trinitarian, 
All that matters when you look is how people are nominally being declared. Also keep in mind that the term anti-Trinitarians or anti-Trinity is the term made by Trinitarians. So anti-Trinitarians never... I mean, if you look pioneers, our pioneers, and they would be over here when we segment the data, the, they never call themselves anti-Trinitarians. They call themselves Seventh-day Adventists. So they believe in the personality of God. They believe in material universe, material presence of God, uh, heavenly uh, sanctuary as a material place, a physical place, and so on. In this point, when, we, when you examine how Sister White exa was acting off, we see that she was promoting the personality of God. But what you see, you never see her nominally declaring to the Trinity doctrine. So Sister White is not on this side. If there was a, ever an opportunity from her side that she can declare herself to be Trinitarian, that was when she was quoting William Boardman. William Boardman uses very clear Trinitarian language and she's just not following that order. So nominally, Sister White is not a Trinitarian. And now, before the heavenly tree quotation, the common ground was over here. But now, if you're following the data, it's not only... So, we, we cross out spiritualism. Now, Ellen White is just crossing this point as well. And what Ellen White is standing here, she's standing here over this side. And this side is something, as we're going to see, that she refers to a true foundation or the right platform. And we're going to study that later, but the questions that are coming and the reasons why people are still reasoning off here is especially concerning one God being the unity of three persons is, well, if you accept that only Father is God, how come Christ be God? Or does that mean that Christ is not God since only one God can be and that is the Father? So these questions, I mean, questions of divinity of Christ, we are going to study next. And those are the things. There is no common ground between the pro-Trinitarian and anti-Trinitarian. I'm not saying that there is a denial of the divinity of Christ. There is approval of divinity of Christ. But the only thing is, they look at the divinity of Christ from a different perspective and those pers perspectives are clashing. In the next study, we're going to look at that. I started this study with James White recommending the High Christian Life book. So, what was about that? Does that mean that James White was suggesting Trinitarian sentiments to our church? And many would like to think this way, but the Trinity Doctrine was not the reason why James White recommended this book. In James White's reply to an evangelical writer, J.J. Abbott, we see the reasons why James White sympathized with the High Christian Life. So, J.J. Abbott gave a bad review of the book and James White responded to his review of the William Boardman's book. In Review and Herald, James White wrote, The Biblical Repository, this is a magazine, for July has an excellent article on evangelical faith showing the supernatural character of the changing involved in that term as used in scripture. Another article in the same number Reviewing Boardman's Higher Christian Life is less satisfactory. The writer, J.J. Abbott, while he is expert in detecting crudities and inconsistencies in the work he is reviewing, appears to us very unfortunate in attempting to account for its popularity. The case of that popularity is not to be found in an impression on the minds of Christians far more general than Mr. Abbott is aware of, that the attainment of more spiritual and elevated piety than the church at the present enjoys is not only to be prayed and hoped for, but to be expected. So the reasons for recommending the higher Christian life was about Boardman's sentiment on Christian sanctification. It has nothing to do with the Trinity doctrine. And even if the spiritualistic sentiments of God are present in this book, according to James White, the book was good, because of the main topic, the sanctification. This is the same thing as if I would recommend the presentation 
by Ivor Myers, The Sonic Warfare. And I really recommend this sermon, regardless that Ivor is sharing a spiritualistic view of God. The sermon is about the influence of music that it has on our character and or our church worship. And everyone, after listening to that sermon and making the decision to give up the worldly music, they would greatly benefit in improving their Christian life. And that is something that I myself can also testify to. But all of you, knowing my understanding of the doctrine of the personality of God, will know that that I'm not recommending the Sonic Warfare Sermon to teach you that one God is also three. So the same principles is also applied to James White. Okay, I'm very sorry that this took so long, but our journey continues to the divinity of Christ. And see you in the next study.